Okay, perfect. Thank you guys for joining us this morning. I'm so happy to get to see so many of you and happy to get to tell you just a little bit about the Cotton Board and the history of the Research and Promotion Program. So the Cotton Board was um, created during the 1960s when cotton growers, not unlike today, were facing a lot of economic pressures. Not only were they facing pressures from pests like the boll weevil, but they were also battling an extreme loss of market share from the rise of use of synthetic fibers. Now, the National Cotton Council had been conducting a research and promotion program for several years, but their leaders got together in 1965 and decided that more needed to be done to combat polyester and those other, quote, miracle fibers. So the industry leaders lobbied Congress who enacted the Cotton Research and Promotion Act of 1966 to establish the Cotton Board. Now under the act, the Cotton Board levied assessments on all cotton produced in the United States and pooled that money to create a strong research and promotion program that was carried out by the Cotton Producers Institute, which is the predecessor to Cotton Incorporated. Legislation alone wasn't enough, and a referendum had to be conducted among all cotton producers. So representatives from our friends over at the National Cotton Council communicated what this new law meant to growers all across the cotton belt, urging them to band together, which they did to pass the referendum with a hefty majority. And then in 1990, Congress expanded the program to include assessment on cotton content of imported goods, almost doubling Cotton Incorporated's budget. Now, the Cotton Research and Promotion Program is a trio of organizations. We're governed, in, um, governed by USDA, and then the Cotton Board collects the assessments, administers the program, and then communicates back to our stakeholders the activities of the program. The Cotton Board also funds Cotton Incorporated, and the board members have fiduciary oversight over the program. Cotton Incorporated implements this program, and they conduct research in farm, on the farm, in labs, and in mills. They promote cotton to consumers and encourage brands and retailers to use cotton for all their textile needs. Now, if you're a frequent cotton and coffee attendee, you've heard a lot about the good work that Cotton Incorporated does. So today, Stacy and I are gonna spend a few minutes talking to you about what we do at the Cotton Board. So our mission at the Cotton Board is to um, serve U.S. producers and importers of cotton and cotton products by effectively and efficiently governing the research and promotion program so that it leads to increased demand and consumption of cotton. As stated in our mission, we're serving both cotton producers and importers of cotton. So it's worth noting that the Cotton Board is one of the only industry organizations that has both producers and importers on our board of directors. At the very heart of the function of the Cotton Board is the charge of fiscal responsibility. As the collection arm of the Cotton Research and Promotion Program, our compliance team, pictured here, Randy Riles, Francis Lucas, and David Vaughn, work diligently to keep our compliance rate at above 99%. Um, we collect a per bale assessment on all upland cotton harvested and ginned in the United States and all cotton content of, the, of upland cotton products imported into the U.S. In 2023, uh, producer assessments were 51% of our assessments collected and importer assessments were 49%. Now, what's exciting about this for growers is that you have a partner in this program and the brands and retailers that use your cotton are also financially investing in the program. Now, the money is collected at the Cotton Board, Fund Cotton Incorporated, they cover the administrative cost of the Cotton Board and the administrative cost of USDA. There are no stakeholder dollars involved, or no taxpayer dollars involved, sorry. Stakeholder money is invested in the program and stakeholder representatives on the Cotton Board guide the investment in cotton's future. 
Our finance team is led by our CFO, Lisa Droke. Lisa also oversees our compliance team, and she diligently invests our assessment dollars and makes sure that all make sure that um, she has good financial oversight over the program. Jamie Webb is our accountant, and she makes sure all of our bills are getting paid and that she is following GAP principles. Lexi Jones provides IT direction and support to our staff and to our board. She also created and maintained the application system where all of our producer assessments are collected electronically. Our president and CEO, Bill Gillen, leads our board administration team. He, along with Tom Eubank, Elizabeth King, and really the rest of our team, work to provide guidance and support for our board members. I work really closely with our executive committee and our officers of the board. The admin team works with USTA to ensure that the program is, here, is adhering to all of their guidelines and expectations. This team plans and executes board meetings quarterly and make sure that the board is kept abreast of any kind of um, action that needs to be taken. They also manage all of the legal and governing documents for the board. Now, speaking of our board, the Cotton Board is made up of 80 members. We have 46 growers with representation from each cotton producing state based on production. We have 30 importer members um, from major brands, retailers, and manufacturers, and we have four advisors to the board. Um, the next slide shows our current officers. You might know quite a few of them. Um, so Mark Nichols is our chairman. He's a producer from Altus, Oklahoma. Akiko Inui is an importer who's working for Ralph Lauren. Um, my, Matt Farmer is a producer from La Mesa, Texas. Rusty Darby is a producer from Chester, South Carolina. And then Sonia Chapman is our past chairman. She's an importer who is a professor at FIT in New York. The Cotton Board's leadership and our membership are dedicated to making sure that the program is working for our stakeholders. So the next slide shows that our program's annual budget cycle and meeting cycle. Each year, the Cotton Board's membership develops a set of recommendations designed to establish industry priorities and needs as Cotton Incorporated works towards the next year's budget. The Cotton Board held this meeting in February this year over in Savannah, Georgia. The Cotton Board's membership is keenly aware of the economic stress being felt in the cotton industry. They believe the research and promotion program has to act to address several critical industry needs. So our top line recommendations for 2025 are, first, we have to continue to push and enhance demand for cotton. Second, we have to be sure we're doing everything possible to enhance industry profitability. I don't have to tell most of y'all on this call, but growers are facing virtually non-existent margins. Downstream cotton users are facing similar financial pressures. So finally, the Cotton Board's membership thinks it's time that we take a good hard look at everything we're doing. And so we're working closely with Cotton Incorporated to, um, to conduct an evaluation of our program over the next year. So you've heard that we collect and manage the assessment funds how we administer the board, and a little bit about how the Cotton Board members fulfill their fiscal responsibility. The third thing we do is communicate the benefits and accomplishments of the program with our stakeholders. So I'm gonna turn the program over to Stacey Gorman, our Director of Communications, and she can tell you a little bit more about those activities. Stacy, Thank you, Emily. Um, yes, uh, thank you for providing the um, overview of some of the core functions of the Cotton Board, uh, and now I'm excited to talk to you all about the communications function. So the Cotton Board is charged with keeping our stakeholders, and by stakeholders we mean the cotton producers and importers who pay into our program, informed about the work being done with their investment. In other words, our communications department is tasked with telling the story of the good work being done by Cotton Incorporated to maintain support of and satisfaction with the Cotton Research and Promotion Program. At the Cotton Board, we aim to provide a level of transparency second to none 
and we utilize many different tactics to get information out to you, our stakeholders. We want to ensure that those of you who fund this program have easy access to information about all the amazing work you're funding. And we want you to know where to go and who to go to if you're looking for more information. Providing transparency when communicating with our stakeholders is our top priority. And it's crucial for several reasons I wanted to go over. So when stakeholders have access to information about our activities, our financials, and our decisions, it helps us build trust, it, en it enhances our accountability, um, and it encourages stakeholders to engage more actively with us. By providing relevant information in an easy to find format and encouraging openness with the people who fund this program, we're able to build strong relationships and create informed stakeholders who work alongside us to ensure the long-term success of the Cotton Research and Promotion Program. So I wanna start by sharing some information about where stakeholders can go if they're looking for information about the program. We have a new section of our website, cottonboard.org, called Stakeholder Transparency. And this section makes it easier than ever to access important program-related information. You can find this page on a tab under the About section on the homepage, or it's on uh, one of the hubs in the Resources section. The page, of this, uh, the page on the website, Stakeholder Transparency, really is the go-to resource when you're seeking detailed information about the program. So when you start exploring this part of the site, you'll find annual reports from both the Cotton Board and Cotton Incorporated. These reports are full of great information and really are a great place to start. Um, they include letters from our chairman, budget and financial information, and departmental highlights for each organization. We also want to make sure our stakeholders can quickly and easily find and access financial and budgetary information for both the Cotton Board and Cotton Incorporated. So we provide budget breakdowns, audited financials, expenditure information, all right there on the website. It's also important for our stakeholders to know who's representing them on our board of directors. So we provide links to board rosters for both the Cotton Board and, the, and Cotton Incorporated's board of directors. There's a lot of other great information that can be found um, under the stakeholder transparency section of the site, including governing documents for the Cotton Board, Cotton Incorporated's semi-annual activity reports, and we also house the full reports from each of the Cotton Board's five-year economic evaluation studies under that section. So I'd really encourage anyone who pays into the program to spend a little bit of time exploring the website. But please know the website is only one of the many ways we're providing information about the work being done through the program. Switching gears, one, information we, one way we push information out to our stakeholders across the Cotton Belt is through our team of regional communication managers, or RCMs as we call them. We have RCMs strategically located in each region of the Cotton Belt, as you can see from this map. You've met them all this morning, and I know you see them out and about regularly in your respective regions. Uh, Christy Short covers the Southwest, Shelley Heinrich covers the Southern Plains, Grant Somm has the Mid-South, and Daniel Radford covers the Southeast. This fantastic team of RCMs are our boots on the ground and the face of the program in the field. The Cotton Board RCMs are in the know about what's happening with the program and Cotton Incorporated, and they're often our first and best connection to our stakeholders. This team is out and about and try to be everywhere their producers are. You'll see them at all the major trade shows throughout the year, and trade shows continue to be a great place for them to meet new growers. They visit cotton producers where they are, on their farms and at the gin. These on-farm visits are a great way to establish a personal connection between a stakeholder and the research and promotion program, often establishing an open line of communication for continued dialogue with our stakeholders. The RCMs also attend and give uh, presentations and program updates at industry meetings and events. They are always available to answer questions and love talking about the program to anyone who needs information. I wanted to share some impressive numbers with you just to show you how hard this team is working. 
Um, the numbers I pulled are from uh, since 2021, when the world started opening back up after COVID. Uh, the RCMs have collectively made 643 gen visits four, and 416 farm visits. Y'all, these are days and nights they're spending on the road, away from their homes and families, where they're out building connections with stakeholders and sharing the good work being done by Cotton Incorporated to increase the demand for and profitability of cotton. Additionally, um, they have attended 642 industry meetings in this time span and given 171 formal presentation at cotton industry meetings. And this doesn't include the times that they've arranged for other members of the Cotton Board staff or Cotton Incorporated staff to present program updates at these meetings or the times when they stand up and give an informal or impromptu program update. And while these numbers and these activities are awfully impressive, I'm not even finished yet. You can tell people all you want about the wonderful work that Cotton Incorporated is doing on their behalf, but sometimes the best way to show someone the great work is to take them and show them. And for that very reason, the Cotton Board hosts producer tours of Cotton Incorporated um, and the world headquarters and research facilities in Cary, North Carolina every year. During these tours, participants have the chance to hear directly from key Cotton Incorporated staff and see and tour the world-class research facilities. This unique program allows attendees to spend a day listening to Cotton Incorporated staff explain uh, their research and developments in their specialized areas of work, as well as visit the innovative laboratories located inside the research facility. The second day of the tour is spent at a local textile mill to see cotton being processed and manufactured into a commercial product. We've hosted two tours so far this year with our third, a Women in Ag tour happening next week. We have three tours on the schedule for 2025. And I'm so proud to report that through the hard work of the RCM's recruiting efforts and the help of our tour sponsors, whose logos are listed below, since 2021, um, which was actually still a very limited year um, following COVID, but we have taken 835 cotton producers to see their research and promotion dollars at work through the tour program. And next week, we'll add over 50 more to that number after our women's tour. So I'll quickly move through a few more of the ways that we're reaching our program stakeholders. Each month, the Cotton Board provides program-related content for cotton farming and cotton grower magazines. For cotton farming, I provide a research and promotion update and the RCMs provide regional updates. <clears throat> we rotate these columns monthly. For Cotton Grower Magazine, I ghostwrite a column for Barry Worsham, the CEO of Cotton Incorporated, called Cotton Advocacy. For Farm Prep, we provide a column for their Mid-South Farm and Gin Show program, and we often contrib contribute to other specialty publications. In addition to our editorial contributions, we also um, run print advertising in these magazines as well. So here's a look what our columns inside of Cotton Grower Magazine look like. Um, if you're flipping through the magazine and you see a page that looks like this, just know you're getting uh, information about the Cotton Research and Promotion Program. For Cotton Farming Magazine, here are some of the topics we've covered so far this year. And as you'll see, you'll get uh, columns from both the regional communication managers and from myself. Uh, one earned media success I'd like to call out is getting the cover story for the December 2023 edition of Cotton Farming Magazine, promoting the 50th anniversary of the Seal of Cotton trademark. That edition of the magazine featured the Seal of Cotton on the cover, along with a three-page story within the magazine. We wrote this story under Kim Kitchings from Cotton Incorporated's byline, and the sentiment of the story reflected on the Seal of Cotton giving an identity to our entire industry. We talked about how the seal has stood the test of time, and we took a look at the importance of brand recognition and relevancy. I also wanted to call attention to our Cotton Leader email newsletter. Uh, this is published once a month and sent directly to your email inbox. The newsletter is full of program updates, and it is a great way uh, for us to stay connected with our stakeholders. If you aren't receiving Cotton Leader and would like to, please sign up on our website, cottonboard.org, or shoot me a message and I'll make sure and get you on the list. The Cotton Board is active on social media on many platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, X, YouTube, and most recently we have um, 
created a page on LinkedIn. These platforms allow us to share key messaging from Cotton Incorporated and other industry partners, as well as create original content and share stories um, from when our RCMs are out in the field. Please make sure you're following us on these platforms if you aren't already. Another way we reach our stakeholders is through our Cotton Board calendar. For over 25 years, the calendar has been mailed out using the Cotton Board producer mailing database. The calendar is distributed each year to over 15,000 recipients including cotton producers, ginners, co-ops, merchants, um, and other industry VIPs. Thousands of other copies are distributed at industry events and through our sponsors. We rely on our sponsors to help offset the production and mailing costs associated with delivering this highly anticipated research, uh, resource each year. And in addition to all the beautiful pictures of cotton that we put in the calendar, the calendar is also full of important updates and information about the work being done through the Cotton Research and Promotion Program. Finally, Cotton and Coffee is one of our best ways that we are able to connect with you, our stakeholders. As most of you know, Cotton and Coffee was born during the pandemic in a time when we were desperately trying to stay in front of and engaged with our stakeholders. And considering we're now in season five, um, and our numbers are growing year over year, I would definitely call this program a success. Uh, we have 12 episodes a year. They happen the third Tuesday of every month. Um, so thank you all for being connected and engaged by being on with us uh, for Cotton and Coffee this morning. And we hope you continue coming back for more updates. So thank you for your time. I've included mine and Emily's email addresses here. And we'll also send them out along with the RCM's contact information in the email um, that we send following this session. So I am gonna stop this recording, stop sharing the screen, and we will um, open it up for Q&A.